Okay, welcome back to the second hour. And we're starting on gynecology. There's a question that was raised during the break in terms of decision-making for a cesarean. And let me just address this. There's a question raised as to how do you decide to do a cesarean for a patient who has severe preeclampsia. On the USMLE 2, they don't expect you to know all the stuff that a resident this, the, the National Board of Medical Examiners consider you a GUMP. You know what a GUMP is? A GUMP, Generalized Undifferentiated Medical Practitioner. So in terms of cesarean, you should know that we're gonna do a cesarean if there's a breach presentation, if there is transverse line, if there's a placenta previa, if there is postpartum hemorrhage that we can't stop, okay, those kind of stuff. The main thing to remember with uh, severe preeclampsia is you don't automatically do a cesarean. You use judgment, but they're not going to ask you those kinds of questions. Okay, let's go on, and I think we got to here, the pap smear. Okay, the pap smear of the surgery is a cytological screening. It is not doing a histology. It is taking cells off the surface of the cervix and smearing it. We want to get two kinds of areas that we want to sample. We want to sample the T-zone or the transformation zone. I will go over that in just a minute. And we want to get a endocervical specimen. So, what kind of cells would we get from the T-zone? What would the histologist or pathologist be looking for? This is looking for squamous cells. What kind of cells would the um, cytologist be looking at on the endocervical specimen? Columnar cells. So they expect to see both squamous and column columnar cells. Okay. It is cytology. Now, this is what we will be looking at the cervix at this view, okay? So here is the cervical canal. This is the endocervical area, and this is the exocervix. Now, you see the exocervix here is covered by a pink epithelium, a stratified squamous epithelium. This area here is more reddish, and that is columnar epithelium. Here you can see it better. Stratified squamous is pink. The, the red, because the capillaries are just one cell from the surface, is columnar. And this, this is a squamo-columnar junction. Squamo-columnar junction. The SCJ. All right? That's going to be important because as we talk about the formation of the transformation zone, you need to have in your brain the concept of a squamo-columnar junction. This is a histologic squamo-columnar junction. Here we have the... This is the uh, columnar epithelium. It looked like this arrow was coming down. The stratified squamous is right here. And this is the columnar epithelium. What happens on the transformation zone is that columnar epithelium, which looks like this, can get uh, changed or transformed into this squamous. Columnar becomes squamous through a process which is known as metaplasia. Metaplasia. We'll come back to that. Again, this is columnar epithelium, stratified squamous epithelium, and this area can get transformed into stratified squamous. Okay, this is in your book on page 147. And what it looks at is the stratified squamous epithelium, which is out here on the exocervix. Here is him, which is pink. See this right here? All right. 
This line here represents the old squamo columnar junction. This line here represents the new squamo columnar junction. And the area between the old and the new squamo columnar junction is known as the transformation zone. Let me show you on one of my personally animated slides. Stratified squamous epithelium pink, columnar epithelium, which is red, and the endocerebral canal, which is black. The old squamous columnar junction starts moving toward the endocerebral canal, and that columnar epithelium gets replaced by stratified squamous epithelium through a process of metaplasia. Now watch what happens. Can you see what's happening here? This is the old squamous columnar junction. This is the new squamous columnar junction. And this area here, this area, let's do it again. Come on. Okay. That is known as the transformation zone. Why is this so important to know? Because 95% of cervical intraepithelial neoplasia arises in the transformation zone. This is the area that we need to be sure we sample with our pap smear, the T zone. Okay, well, let me just go back for a moment. What is it that uh, uh, stimulates the transformation of the columnar to the stratified squamous epithelium? And what it is, is it is the acidification of the vagina. As the estrogen levels rise, and as the lactobacillus levels rise, and the lactobacillus bacteria will uh, take glycogen from the vaginal cells and create lactic acid, which makes for an acidic environment. And the acidic environment is what leads to the transformation. So it happens at puberty. OK, this area, which is the kind of reddish pink, not the pink pink, on your page 147, that's not abnormal. It is normal appearing, and it is called metaplastic epithelium. This is an important point to distinguish. This is not abnormal epithelium. This is normal epithelium, but it is metaplastic. See, neoplastic would be abnormal. Metaplastic is normal. Safety, thank you for your kind encouragement. Okay, metaplasia is a reversal, reversible replacement of one differentiated cell type with another mature differentiated cell type. It is not dysplasia. It is metaplasia. Okay, this is another image, and you can see here on the uh, black arrow is a squamous columnar junction. The dotted dashed area is probably where the junction was, and the area between is known as the T zone. Okay, we already talked about two specimens endocervical and exocervical. The conventional pap smear takes the cells and smears them onto a glass slide. Then you take the glass slide and you put some alcohol on it or you uh, spray it with hairspray. You fix it. The liquid-based pap is a new one, which you should be aware of. This does not smear the cells. You rinse the cells into a fluid medium. It is The cells are then precipitated in a hopefully thin layer on the glass slide, and that's how they are seen. And there are many advantages theoretically to this. This is our traditional pap smear. We have a wooden spatula, and we uh, rotate it around, and we get the exocervical specimen. And then the endocervical specimen can be either using a uh, Q-tip, which we would do in the non-pregnant, or a brush in the pregnant. Uh, the reason we don't 
don't use a brush here is because you can see the square mode columnar junctions right here. These cells can, uh, because they're hypervascular, can bleed. So we smear here and we spray. You could get air drying if you wait too long. The problem potentially is you have abnormal cells, which are red. You smear, 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 but it doesn't come off of your uh, brush. And so you throw it into the garbage. And then you have a false negative pap smear. There were really abnormal cells, but they never made it to the slide. The other thing is that the cells can be put on top of each other when you smear them, and they look like this. And what kind of assessment can you make when you look at these cells? So an alternative is to do a liquid based, what we used to be called thin layer, and use a brush like this. Now this is a model of a cervix, and you put these long brush uh, areas into the canal, and you will rotate it around 10 times. You rotate it 10 times, and it will take simultaneously endocervical specimens from the long brush areas, and the exocervical here. And then you rinse it into a preserving solution. And then you precipitate the cells down like this. And can you see how much better this looks than does this? Now, of course, this is the worst of the worst. This is the best of the best. And it's interesting, the new PAPS may recommendations say that you can use either one. I thought they would say the liquid-based was better. But they, they say you can use either one. We do use liquid-based method at our institution. OK, the advantage is the liquid-based. You have a single layer of cells, a monolayer of cells, rather than having them on top of each other. You eliminate air drying because you don't smear it. You put it into the liquid right away. And then the uh, residual cells, which are still there and could be alive, can be used for an HPV DNA testing without getting a separate specimen. And we'll talk about that when we look at chapter four. So here are the cells which are floating around in the fluid as a result of uh, taking the brush and rinsing it off. 